I guess let's get started. So uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for uh, coming. So today I'm going to talk about the service mesh journey at DoorDash over the last two years. Uh, we will discuss what's been uh, good, what's been bad, and yes, even some, uh, a little bit, some ugly stuff. Uh, my name is Ho Chun. I have been a software engineer at DoorDash core infrastructure team since 2020, uh, mainly focusing on uh, compute and traffic infrastructure. And before that, I was working on building some distributed systems for machine learning uh, at several startups until I realized uh, that's just probably too hard for me. Uh, all right, so let's get started. Why service mesh for DoorDash? Uh, so in 2019, uh, DoorDash started the effort to extract microservices from a single monolithic application. And fast forward to the end of Q1 2021, we found ourselves with over 50 microservices. And you know, with this growth came with those you know, classic microservice challenges. Uh, observability has been challenging. Debugging was much harder. Our service topology became a maze of complexity, and no one really knows who is talking to whom and who owns what. Our microservices could talk to each other in so many different ways. They could use service IP, they could use our headless service with client-side load balancing, or they could just use load balancing, a load balancer. And there was no standard way to do our authentication and authorization. And besides that, developers were just implementing so many sim similar things in the application code using our so many different ways. So uh, in Q2 2021, we started exploring service mesh, which we believed has the potential to address the above uh, challenges. We believe that you know, by implementing so many features at the platform layer in a more standard way, it's far more efficient than uh, addressing them uh, individually at the application layer. So we started searching for solutions, and we did explore various open source projects. And Probably, let's, you know, before we look at the initial decision, uh, let's take a quick overview of our requirements at the time. So uh, first thing first, scalability. Uh, our microservices actually were, uh, around the time, were all deployed on one single uh, big Kubernetes cluster with more than 2,000 nodes. And typically, uh, we felt uncomfortable whenever a cluster has more than 1,000 nodes because a lot of open source tools we used uh, were basically tested with, at most, with uh, a thousand nodes. And in reality, we did uh, you know, observe some random scalability and uh, reliability issues whenever we had a cluster more than a thousand nodes. And obviously, we couldn't afford uh, any outage of that single cluster because that's the only thing we have. Uh, so first thing first, we wanted the solution to be able to support uh, our scale at, the, at that time. Flexibility. So. We don't want to live with that single Kubernetes cluster forever. So I guess to make our uh, life easier, we implemented a console-based uh, multi-cluster infrastructure and started the migration uh, already to move some microservices to new clusters to put less pressure on that old single uh, Kubernetes, Kubernetes cluster's control plan. So we needed the solution to be uh, less opinionated and more flexible enough to support our unique uh, multi-cluster setup. And tools, of course, uh, we use should have a mature community and solutions need to be supported by our successful user stories, uh, supported by some uh, other companies similar to our scale. And it was also essential for our solution to be easy enough to uh, configure with some uh, comprehensive documentation as well. And lastly, you know, to, uh, we need the solution to provide features in observability, security, reliability, and traffic management to address those you know, typical microservice challenges uh, we mentioned before. And after spending a lot of time um, you know, exploring various open source projects, including those most popular ones at the time, uh, we settled on Envoy as our, our data plan while developing our custom control plan to align with our specific needs. And you are probably familiar with this architecture today, uh, which is still you know, kind of most common and typical solution nowadays. Uh, traffic redirection is managed by IP tables, and sidecar injection is managed by Kubernetes mutating webhook. Uh, data plan runs as a sidecar container for each pod, uh, handling all ingress and egress traffic for HTTP 1, HTTP, and gRPC traffic. Uh, at that time, we don't manage, uh, we, we don't manage any uh, storage-related traffic. The control plan just manages the configurations for these Envoy sidecar containers using XDS API. I guess it's worth to mention 
that building our own control plan was not an easy decision at the time, especially uh, considering we have been always a small team on this project, usually uh, with just more, one or two engineers until very recently. And while the service mesh landscape has involved a lot nowadays, um, to be honest, our choice might be uh, different today, uh, but given our uh, unique requirements at that time, uh, this path was probably the most uh, logical choice. So for adoption, when we began the journey, uh, we knew we wanted so many features from Service Mesh to address those microservice challenges. But however, to be, to be honest, what exact features we wanted uh, to use was a little bit unclear. Uh, and the plan was basically to onboard everyone to Service Mesh with minimal features and then decide uh, what additional features we want to support later. So however, uh, I guess a significant turning point occurred on June 19th, 2021. That's when DoorDash uh, experienced a complete outage lasting over more than uh, two hours. If you are interested in the details, I also linked the RCA in the slides as well. But I guess the key takeaway from that RCA is that uh, the outage was actually caused by a typical cascading uh, failure, starting with some high latency issues initially in our payment system. And as clients like Dasher Service attempt retries, retries, and probably retries, they recurred a retry storm eventually that further overloaded the already uh, struggling payment service. And uh, eventually that caused a complete outage, which caused us to basically shut off the traffic from the edge layer uh, twice to put less pressure on the payment service and give it just more time to, to recover. We realized that this situation could have been prevented or at least mitigated with some standard best practices that we always recommend to teams. So for instance, we should have, what should have happened is that uh, the payment service itself could have implemented load shedding to proactively reject some load uh, when it's already in the degraded state, uh, like in this case, high latency, so that it could at least prevent itself from a complete outage. Also, the clients of payment service could have used our circuit breakers to fail fast whenever payment service returned uh, some higher error rate, and it could just periodically check whether payment service is back to normal and decide whether it's time to talk back to payment service again. So for these two reliability-related features, we did have them implemented in some common Kotlin libraries, since that's, the one, uh, that's our primary uh, program language. And however, services like the payment service are, we're still using other program languages, in this case, uh, Python. So it was kind of in, uh, challenging to implement all these reliability features across the board. And unfortunately, we had several similar instances before. So this eventually led to many uh, teams to have a code freeze for a month focusing exclusively just on reliability-related uh, tasks. And that's also the point that folks started asking, what's the status of service mesh, which you know, has the potential to uh, implement these reliability features in a language agnostic way. Uh, so where did we stand with the project? We, well, we basically had nothing. We just started the initial uh, you know, you know, design and reviewed it and started the implementation. Uh, we didn't have any uh, operational experience with running M1 in production and there was basically no control plan at that time. So this outage basically made us realize the urgency of shipping the project sooner. So instead of waiting to build a complete control plan and onboard everyone first, we understood the importance of addressing the most immediate and pressing issues first. So eventually we decided to shift our priority. And let's look at their design after the priority shift, after the outage. Similarly, traffic redirection and sidecar injection is still unchanged, still using IP tables and mutating webhook. The biggest change is in the configuration management system. So instead of the API-based configuration management uh, system, we used a file-based dynamic configurations. So users put configuration, Envoy configurations in a GitHub repository, and then a CD pipeline just package and ship uh, this configuration to an S3 bucket, uh, which then just get pulled uh, and mounted to the Envoy sidecar through our 
one existing uh, internal service, which we call uh, S3 Thinker in this diagram. And Envoy can still hard restart whenever there, there's any updates in the Envoy configurations. So uh, leveraging their existing CD pipeline and that uh, S3 Thinker service saved us a lot of time for the configuration management story. <laughs> and Envoy was configured as a uh, HTTP password proxy using their Envoy uh, original destination cluster. Uh, instead of uh, given no features, we added two reliability-related features, adaptive concurrency for that load shedding behavior and outlier detection uh, to have a similar behavior as our circuit breaking to basically help us prevent our similar outage from happening again. So this design, as you can see, uh, had a very primitive configuration management approach, and the focus primarily was around the data plan. Specifically, specifically for these two reliability features provided by Envoy. And actually, at that time, we started calling the project Envoy Sidecar uh, rather than Service Mesh. So once we successfully implemented and tested our solution in staging, we onboarded two critical Python services, which include the payment service, which uh, was the one that caused the uh, site-wide outage. A little bit about the onboarding process uh, requires two steps. And firstly, just uh, similar to many open source solutions, we need uh, to add some custom label to the namespace and deployment spec. And then we also need to create raw Envoy configurations at the time, which typically includes around 1,000 lines of configurations, which as you can, uh, in, uh, as you can imagine, overwhelming for everyone at the time, uh, even though we just had two customers. So the good news for developers was that they didn't need to uh, modify any uh, application code. For the rollout strategy, to gradually, roll out, uh, to gradually introduce the Envoy sidecar, we used the Canary deployment approach. Users need to deploy another independent Kubernetes Canary deployment, which uses the same application, application code as the production one, but runs with the Envoy sidecar injected. So the, Envoy, the Canary deployment shares the same labels as the production one, uh, which matches the selector defined in the service object. And that's how send traffic could be sent to uh, those Canary pods as well. And so this allowed users to adjust their Canary deployment's replica count to control the amount of traffic routed to the pods running with the sidecar. And for these two services, we then baked the traffic for Around two weeks, we were doing this super cautiously because the whole point was to prevent an uh, outage like that. And once we felt uh, confident about everything, we then scaled down the Canary deployment and run the production one with the Envoy sidecar injected. So the rollout eventually was smooth, and uh, for these two services, they have their extra protection without any code changes eventually. So this, I guess, brings me to the first lessons we learned along the way. So looking back, we believed that shifting our priority to build a, this you know, very simplified solution was the right decision. We initially had a very big dream, but we needed to clarify our immediate goals and start with something small. So looking back on our journey, actually many big changes were uh, driven by the motivation to solve some real world uh, problems uh, within the org. So in Q1 2022, the project, the Envoy Sidecar project uh, reached GA status. Uh, we created configuration templates instead of having developers to configure those raw Envoy configurations, which as you can tell, makes it impossible. We offered a common dashboard for networking matrix, provided common alerts and run books to monitor common issues like you have higher rate or you, you just have you know, high latency. Uh, we expanded our user uh, base by reaching out to our uh, more early adopters and onboarding services uh, in more uh, different programming languages. And with this successful user story from our initial customers and the announcement of that GA status, uh, in 2022, we started hearing more feature requests from teams as well. So one big ask was to support Zoom aware routing. So typically our microservices are deployed across all uh, different availability zooms in Kubernetes. And previously, the default behavior is that the egress traffic from clients in service one in this diagram is load balance uh, between all destination or server pods of service two. So it's a pattern of basically everyone talks to everyone. And 
the idea of zone overrouting is to route the egress traffic of clients to its local availability zone while uh, ensuring the ingress traffic received by each individual or server path is still balanced. So staying with the same availability zone has a couple of benefits. And firstly, it saved us some uh, cross AZ data transfer costs and reduced the impact of one uh, AZ outage. And also making the communication uh, more performant because uh, we are now connecting the clients to their nearby servers. And given its impact in all these reliability, efficiency, and performance uh, areas, and given especially efficiency is uh, was our uh, one of our engineering uh, priority in 2022, we decided to support this feature. And that's the point that we could take the opportun opportunity to involve the configuration management system as well, uh, leading to this uh, introduction of the API-based dynamic configuration for all the EDS resources. And now our NXDS resources, NXDS servers read the IP addresses from the source of truth, which in our case is console, and ships all IP addresses with our AZ information back to the Envoy sidecar. So that, you know, given this information, the data plan can just perform Zoom aware routing. It turns out Zoom aware routing was just the beginning. Uh, we co-developed many more features with our initial customers uh, throughout the year. Um, this process uh, helped us to get a better understanding and deeper understanding of our customer uh, pain points and helped us prioritize additional features beyond those initial uh, reliability related uh, features. So in our case, many use cases we heard were related to uh, traffic management and with our very particular focus on header-based routing, uh, load balancing and traffic uh, policy. So today, all these features are in production but at that time, with the introduction of all these new features, we quickly realized that uh, the, more, uh, the more services we adopt, the more benefits we could have. So we continue to focus on increasing adoption throughout the year. And by the end of 2022, we eventually onboarded around 100 services, which uh, doesn't sound bad, right? Uh, given that we, we were really a small team with just one or two engineers. Uh, for, helping people to onboard. And, but that's also the point that people started asking when we can onboard all services. So unfortunately, uh, some back of the napkin mask quickly showed us that it would take us several more years to onboard most services to service mesh. And that you know, it became evident that we had to speed up the onboarding process. So in Q4 2022, we decided to review what could prevent us having uh, moving faster in 23 and what changes we should make before 23. The first thing I want to mention here is that in the initial adoption phase, we have discovered a lot of unknowns. We found many special client behaviors that was previously unnoticed, but became apparent with the introduction of Envoy Sidecar. So here are taking our first customer payment service as an example. So there was a client which uh, couldn't perform client-side load request level uh, load balancing for the gRPC traffic. So before, uh, before the Envoy sidecar was injected to balance the traffic, it turns out that the payment service was just periodically recycling connections so that a uh, client could create new connections to other parts, in this case, part two in the diagram. And however, injecting the sidecar into payment service part disrupted this balance. And now, only the connection between payment service card sidecar and payment will be recreated, and the client would just always talk to payment service part one in this case, leading to an ingress traffic imbalance over time. And eventually, we had to move the similar behavior to the sidecar by adjusting the connection age uh, configurations in the servers uh, and one sidecar. We also quickly realized that uh, this example was just the tip of the iceberg, and we were basically in a phase where we didn't know what we didn't know. So we continued to uncover uh, more special unnoticed client behaviors, and the introduction of the Envoy sidecar broke whatever just broke, uh, worked before. This highlighted that making the data plan always transparent isn't uh, easy, and we had to uh, kind of expect the unexpected in their initial adoption phase. 
And that's why we had to use that canary uh, deployment approach for a while. Unfortunately, as we onboard more services, by the end of Q4 22, we figured that we were not seeing this kind of unknowns that often. And that's the point we decided to take some bet. We believe that we uncovered um, most unknowns already, and it's probably okay to roll out faster as long as we can roll back fast. So the first change we made was shifting from that canary deployment approach to uh, where we also bake traffic for days to that, you know, uh, uh, the native, you know, Kubernetes built-in rolling update message. Uh, this did significantly reduce onboarding time from days to hours. We also realized many challenges in developer experience could prevent us having a large scale adoption. And firstly, we used to ask teams to follow some onboarding documentation to onboard their service. Adding some labels and some Envoy configuration sounds easy, but actually every team needed to follow some documentation. And we are talking about 400 more services here. So we realized this decentralized onboarding approach doesn't scale for us. Similarly, we ask every individual team to manage their Envoy sidecar resources, which doesn't scale as well. So we decided to have the infra team to own the onboarding process and the resource management story, which is you know, the team that is most familiar with the process and the team that is most f motivated to improve the process. And eventually we did streamline the onboarding process by pre-generating all those Envoy configurations and labels for all services. Throughout the year, we also noticed we put our um, primary focus on onboarding and making the Envoy sidecar transparent, but we didn't put enough time on educating our users, and users were lack of some basic understanding of service mesh, and that eventually caused some confusions we decided to just enhance our documentation and invest in more time on, on, in educating and enabling our service owners. The complexity of observability features is also another big one. Networking issues still happened, of course, but the matrix we provided were just overwhelming. There were just too many matrix and it was super hard for our users to know what matrix to look at. We exposed all terminologies uh, used in Envoy matrix to our users, and they have to learn stuff like what is our ingress, egress, downstream, upstream, local, remote, connections, requests, responses, messages, gRPC, HTTP1, HTTP2, stuff like that, all this stuff. Uh, but not all engineers enjoyed uh, looking into every single detail of all the data. So <laughs> we should have our you know, product mindset here and be more customer obsessed here. So we invested some time in simplifying the dashboard to make matrix more user-friendly by giving our users most important high-level uh, matrix. We also noticed that, ironically, sometimes uh, with the introduction of service mesh, debugging was more complicated. Uh, since the architecture became more uh, complicated, now we have multiple Envoy sidecar in, in the call pass, and when some errors happened, it wasn't always clear whether they were triggered by service mesh or not. Their infrastructure team was just involved into more incidents to assist product teams to, uh, to debug, and this sometimes caused frustrations on both sides. So to provide clarity in identifying issues, we introduced service mesh availability as errors to show all errors that are originated from Envoy sidecar. We also introduced distributed tracing to have a better view to show our users, which component in the service graph are, is actually returning the error. Service graph. So we realized many features are actually enabled only when the egress dependency are defined. Uh, features like the zone aware routing, outlet detection, and even for those uh, most basic upstream level metrics require users to define their uh, Envoy cluster, egress cluster in their configurations. And however, uh, users are not uh, sure about their service graph, and there was basically no tools available for this purpose. So eventually, we decided to build an accurate service graph from the tracing data that we just introduced, and then build a tool to generate those egress configurations based on the tracing data. 
So following the execution of the uh, plan, we started massive adoption and things were doing okay overall. Onboarding was uh, much faster. We had a few unexpected issues for some services, which is kind of expected, uh, resulting in around two or three incidents. But uh, fortunately, we were able to roll back fast before things went uh, wild. And there is some additional maintenance responsibility on the infrastructure team, which is, I guess, still maintainable nowadays. Uh, many features like uh, client side load balancing, zoom aware routing, and header based routing are uh, also widely adopted. So here is a quick overview of our current state. Our microservices are deployed on around 10 production Kubernetes clusters. We have more than 500 microservices deployed in five isolated production mesh. Within each mesh, there are multiple clusters, and there are today more than 10,000 pods and around 5 million RPS managed by mesh nowadays. So here's a quick overview of our current and future work. Developer velocity became a prominent concern. Uh, more efforts are now directed towards having the experience of configuring Envoy uh, more developer friendly and improving the user experience of uh, leveraging or observability related uh, features. For efficiency, the way we are currently uh, save the cost of compute and matrix usage is uh, still manual and we need tools, tools to eliminate the waste here. We are also trying to leverage mesh to simplify some other uh, traffic infrastructures. Uh, so in this case, we are actively working on some uh, new uh, architecture to build the multi-cluster service discovery uh, solution. And of course, of course, we should uh, continue to add uh, more features to support our, uh, uh, support our users. So, all right, so here is a quick recap of what we have discussed. So before you start the journey, we figured that really understanding your requirements and the use cases is important, and you can co-develop your features with your initial customers. And when working with Envoy, uh, we noticed that it's hard to make the Envoy sidecar always transparent, so you probably have to expect the unexpected in the initial adoption phase. When onboarding services are testing things uh, gradually at the beginning, it makes them uh, well-informed bets at the right time. And decentralized onboarding doesn't scale, even though the process required uh, low effort from uh, the, the user. And try to streamline, streamline and automate the onboarding process instead. And when delivering product to the rest of the engineering team, uh, Envoy metrics could be overwhelming uh, and have a product mindset and be more customer uh, obsessed when you build the product. Uh, invest some time in training and uh, enabling service owners, uh, but increasing the velocity through some uh, more simpler and more uh, automated solution is actually more uh, important. All right, uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Right. I think we still have some time for a question. Yeah. You can go to the mic. Hi, uh, I hey. have to ask, would you still develop a service mesh architecture from scratch today if you started to try to solve this same problem again? Um, so I guess with the, with the current architecture, we probably, so I guess the first thing is that we have to have some use cases to motivate us to probably move some new architecture. And wait, I'm saying put on your, uh, like, pretend you have nothing, right? You're starting 2021 with uh, tools and solutions that are available today. Mm -hmm. what, um, would you still build your own? Uh, I guess we will have to evaluate the or the solutions again. Uh, it's been two years already, and honestly, a lot of our 
are the traffic-related infrastructures are actually improved by the current service mesh architecture. So it's kind of hard to say that we, we, we are given what we have today because what we have today has service mesh kind of tightly coupled in, in the architecture. Um, but we are actually are evaluating uh, some other solutions as well because we do have some uh, use cases. Uh, for our case, we wanted to introduce our network policy and that's why we are actually evalu evaluating uh, Cilium to uh, introduce it as our CNI first and then evaluate it. Maybe we could leverage so some more uh, L7 level uh, uh, features. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and you already know of some gaps uh, maybe between something like an Istio or Cilium uh, that they wouldn't be suitable, I guess, uh, to solve the same problems that, that, that you developed for? I think, uh, it's been a while last time when I checked all the solutions, but okay. I guess the common concern nowadays is still around the developer experience uh, side, how to make the, your life of configuration, all the configurations easier. Uh, that's, I guess, some common concern that even now with our custom solutions we are trying to, uh, trying to solve. And our current solution is trying to expose all uh, these kind of experience through our common interface. We are trying to develop some uh, developer portal to manage all these configurations. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. So I noticed that you talked a lot about how you're using console for service discovery. Uh -huh. Did you evaluate using console connect as a service mesh? We did. We did uh, tried, uh, we did reach out to console folks in the community. Um, I, I guess I, if I still remember correctly, we were mainly concerned you know, we wanted the mature, the most mature solution because we only, we were really a small team. So we tend to be a little bit more conservative and just try the most mature solution at the time. So that's why we probably tried uh, the MOSI car approach. Um, that makes and, sense. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, uh, I kind of wondering like, uh, given the limited engineer resource back in the 2019, What's the most motivation for you to build your own control plane instead of using some other solutions like uh, Linkerd or H2? Right. We actually spent a lot of time <laughs> trying to make the existing open source solutions work for us. Uh, so I can probably give some examples. So we tried Linkerd uh, first. And as I mentioned, we have a big cluster that has 2,000 nodes. And we were kind of asking around, hey, uh, you know, what's your biggest uh, cluster you can support? And the story we heard was from other users was around 400 nodes, which makes us uh, a little bit scared. And the way Linkerd support the multi-cluster story uh, is a little bit open-ended that cannot support our own uh, console-based solution. So I guess we were also, another thing is uh, our traffic team also were uh, leveraging the Envoy proxy to manage the edge traffic. So it's probably more, makes more sense to consolidate the, the effort for the data plan there. Our uh, Istio, uh, a couple of my colleagues tried Istio, but they were uh, initially scared by their complexity of their, all the configurations to basically set up the most basic uh, uh, configurations. Uh, and we had some concerns about the control plan at the time. That was even before, uh, before uh, I think everyone, uh, we still moved to the monolithic related architecture. So eventually we had to, uh, decided to build our own. Yeah. But that's a, that's a good point. We, we are actually trying to make us not uh, be locked into this kind of self uh, you know, uh, in-house solution, and we are trying to leverage some uh, opportunities to probably uh, move to some uh, new uh, architecture eventually, if that's possible. That's why I mentioned we, pro we are evaluating using Cilium as the CNI as the starting point. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. You mentioned availability zone aware routing. Um, could you elaborate on that a little bit more? Is it uh, 
preferring pods in the same AZ within a cluster? Mm -hmm. And just how do you prevent things from becoming imbalanced if, say, the source has more pods in one place uh -huh. and the destination yeah. a different place? Um, so the, the traffic is controlled by the data plan. So what we are doing in the control plan is to read all the IP addresses with all the AZ information from the source of truth console in this case, and then ship the, all the uh, IP addresses and uh, you know, all the, those EDS resources back to the Envoy sidecar. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, we are just leveraging the data plan to actually perform the Zoom over routing. So I was curious about the, you mentioned you had some challenges when you built some of these things, developers didn't know how to debug. So they were asking the product team to debug and you ended up adding some observability. So first of all, was that enough? Were there still use cases where developers had to debug? No, uh, how did that's, you that's definitely not enough. I guess that action item was basically to unblock us to move faster in 23. And the debugging experience nowadays is still uh, not great. The current uh, direction is try to leverage, unify, unify all the uh, data from all the different uh, sources, matrix, uh, logs, and uh, traces, and uh, just give a better interface uh, to our users. And we are also actually evaluating building some automate, automated tools to help us to basically uh, summarize what is going on using, uh, using AI as well. Okay. So one last question. So it looks like you made a lot of design choices, architectural choices. Was it just one team making these decisions? Were there multiple teams? And what kind of process and red tape did you have to go through? To uh, it's decided this? by the traffic and compute team are within the core infrastructure org. And we do, actually, whenever we make big changes, we do propose the RFC to, to the engineering org. Yeah. Sorry. Hmm? Uh, honestly, for the service mesh team, usually it's been just one or two engineers uh, for a while. Uh, but now we have around, you know, it's joined the, uh, we moved the service mesh project into the traffic team now, and the traffic team currently has around 10-ish engineers. Okay. 